It's been another week of rows and resignations over the Tories' plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda. And on Question Time, Barrister Hashi Mohammed said it wasn't worth all the energy. We know it's not worth it. You know it's not worth it. I'm sure Bim really deep down in his heart knows it's not worth it. And yet, let's think about what's happening right now. First things first, it's important to acknowledge that people are really concerned about the boats crossings and so many people are dying and something has to be done. I think any rational person agrees on that level. Two years ago, I traveled to Dresden, the German town, and I met an Eritrean man who had been deported from Israel to Rwanda. He'd been paid to go to Rwanda. Rwanda had a reciprocal arrangement with Israel to take refugees. When he got there, the Rwandans said, you don't need to stay, there's the door. And he used the money that he was given to make his way back that treacherous journey and he made his way to Dresden where he sought asylum again. The Supreme Court in Israel struck down that law and when we got to our Supreme Court, there's a passage by our learned judges where they said the Home Office hadn't even assessed the Israel-Rwanda policy before they decided to adopt it. That's really interesting, that final point, because he's saying, look, you know, the UK often say this is an experimental policy. Of course, it's not going to work straight away, um, but we are sort of at the front line when it comes to working out how to deal with asylum seekers in the 21st century, in a very cruel way, by the way. But he's saying this has been tried before um, and it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is because you can send people to Rwanda, but if they're free to leave again, you know, they didn't want to go to Rwanda in the first place. I mean, it sounds like in this instance, they wanted to go to Israel, then they got sent to Rwanda, and then they ultimately go to, to Germany. I suppose as the Tory party, you could say, well, if they go to Rwanda and then they leave Rwanda and go to a different European country, fine, as long as they don't come back here. I mean, that might be the conservative policy. As we've, you know, said so many times, though, on this show. The Rwanda policy isn't going to deter anyone because the plan has over, only ever been to sort of send 1% of, of people um, to Rwanda. If people have risked their lives to come from the Middle East or North Africa, they're not going to be deterred by a 1% chance of, of getting sent to Rwanda where they might just leave again. Um, Hashi Mohammed is a very impressive guy and he's very well qualified to speak on the topic of the law and refugee policy. This is from a profile of him in The Guardian. Mohammed is a Somali who was born in Kenya, where he lived in a rundown part of Nairobi with his four siblings, another having died, his mother, who also had six children from a previous marriage, and his traveling salesman father. When his father died in a car accident in 1993, Mohammed and three of his siblings were sent to England as refugees. They lived with an aunt and then in various low-rent housing, some of it rat-infested, and were eventually reunited with their mother. A confused and alienated boy, he spent most of his teen years in a state of geographical and psychological dislocation. He went to a struggling comprehensive in northwest London, where the head teacher was beaten up and laughed at, but he eventually managed to get a place at the University of Hertfordshire to study law and French. From there, he was awarded a postgraduate scholarship to Oxford, gained a position at Number 5 Chambers, noted experts in planning law, became a successful barrister, an accomplished public speaker, and a broadcaster. He's made two well-received documentaries for Radio 4, and he's just written a book. Now, if this was something that was sort of in discussion in the public domain now, you'd say, what, he came as a refugee just because his father died? That doesn't sound like a real refugee, right? Now, I don't know the history of this guy, but the facts of the matter are, he came to Britain, um, got an incredibly you know, impressive education against all the odds and is now working as a very impressive barrister, right? Clearly an asset to, to British society. And we would say, well, you're not entitled to asylum just because your father has died. Um, so, you know, he's a good example of how it can be a bit short-sighted to sort of treat everyone with suspicion who's trying to come to the country. Um, with that in mind, let's see what Mohammed went on to say next. We know it's not going to work. It's unviable, it's expensive, and the only person it's working for is the Rwandans, because they won't give us a penny back. And what we're seeing right now, instead of them actually dealing with this properly and actually having some real ideas, do you know what they're doing? They're attacking our judges. They're attacking our rule of law. They are dividing a society. They are making us feel like refugees are the scum and who are foreign. They refer to the European courts that we are a part of that have United Kingdom judges as foreign courts. It's not only just disgusting, as this young lady was saying, it's unconscionable. The rhetoric is poison. 
And we have to acknowledge that. And absolutely, I end where I started, which is this is an issue that we need to grapple with. The gentleman talked about the French authorities. The French authorities have offered for us to station ourselves over there, provided we pay. Imagine how much we could have used for that 400,000 pounds on that side of the channel. 400 to actually, million. 400 million, I beg your pardon, for us to be on that side of the channel to monitor it. Instead, this week, with everything that's happening in the world, everything that's happening in this country, this week, our prime minister spent his precious time mm. dealing with the loonies in his parties. It's unconscionable. Yeah. So... Again, very, very well put. I mean, it was interesting he was sort of saying something does need to be done about this. This isn't a sustainable situation. He sort of proposed um, that if the UK had, a, I suppose, a processing centre, was it, or just a monitoring centre? I suppose a, a processing centre in, in, in Calais would make sense to stop people um, crossing the channel. Of course, that only would work, in a way, would be piggybacking off the, the harsh border control that the European Union has because people can only get to the UK from France, of course, or obviously some other um, Northern European countries, Belgium, potentially the Netherlands. I think it's mainly France and Belgium, isn't it? This is an issue where actually I don't know um, where it's going to go, because obviously if you're uh, you know, the Euro if, if you're a European country, if you're Italy and you put a, a processing centre on in North Africa, I think you'll get lots of people applying and then lots of people who won't get accepted and then they might still take the boat route. So I do think this is a difficult issue, but I do think that the Conservatives... They're just doing a, a ridiculous form of politics. Hours and hours and hours of rowing, resignations, drama on political news pro programs for something that everyone recognizes won't work. And there's sort of another suggestion as to why this won't work, um, which has come out this week, which I've found very interesting. It's from Faisal Islam. Um, so he's offered some commentary on what he's been hearing in Davos. I mean, it all sort of comes from this impromptu interview um, with Rwanda's president at Davos on Wednesday. BBC, Mr. Gummy, is the UK deal working? Ask the UK. The Supreme Court said that your country's not safe. Is it safe for refugees? Ask the UK. It is the UK's problem, not the Rwanda's problem. But you're getting hundreds of millions of UK taxpayers' money with not a single refugee. It is going to be used for those people who will come. If they don't come, we can return the money. There might be no. Okay. Faisal Islam has now followed up from that um, interview with these posts on, on Twitter. So he says, epic Davos buzz, Fred, which is a little bit ridiculous, but let's go on. Um, Leading African figures told me privately that Kagame's clear frustration with the UK-Rwanda deal communicated to me, it's UK's problem, we have money back, or we can have money back. Also reflect eyebrows being raised in other African nations about general look for a man who likes to be seen as the modern leader of a confident Africa and who may have clocked that it may be reversing his considerable investments in nation branding, for example, I'm sponsoring Premier League football teams. He goes on, remember there are two sides to this deal, so the UK-Rwanda deal. I got a note from a very connected commentator after my doorstep, quote, it's a really bad look for him. He knows that the whole point of this policy is to make the UK government look tough on migrants on the grounds that Rwanda is presumptively a terrible place to be sent to. It puts the Rwanda country brand back like 20 years. The only thing people associate with the country is the worst place the Brits can think to send people. Now, context here, some real buzz about Africa jumping value chains, not just producing minerals, but the finished products the world needs and doing so within a massive new free trade area. Um, I thought this was a really interesting angle, Aaron, um, that isn't talked about much in the UK media. And, you know, to be frank, which we haven't talked about much on this show either, which is that if you are, um, well, in this case, a Rwandan government, but any other government that the UK might seek to make such a deal with, you know, you want to present yourself as a, as a great place to invest, a, you know, a positive up and coming place in the world. If you're famous for being, you know, for want of a better phrase, a dumping ground for, for migrants that other people don't want. And actually, a, you know, a, a deterrent, our whole country is a deterrent. You know, like when, when you think of deterrence, you think of, you think of prison, don't you? You say as a deterrent, we're sending people to Rwanda. It's putting Rwanda sort of on the same level as a prison. Um, it's not a good look, is it? And so it might be the case that even if this gets up and running, um, you know, countries are reluctant to engage in these kinds of deals with countries in the global north. Oh, we don't want these migrants, so we'll give you some money to take them. It's like, well, that doesn't, you know, that's not really the role we want to be playing in the global economy. No, that's totally right. I mean, the deal that um, was mentioned there in terms of, um, you know, national branding is obviously Arsenal. I don't know if people know this, but, you know, you've got Visit Rwanda sponsoring Arsenal Football Club, obviously a major a global football brand, not cheap. That's about £10 million a year, that deal. You're flushing money down the toilet, right? If on the one hand you're saying, oh, let's 
let's you know promote our national brand. People can do eco tourism or God knows what in Rwanda. I think it's quite good for that, right? Um, go look at you know um, megafauna and these you know giant creatures and whatnot, and 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 kinds of wilderness that broadly well they exist in some of Europe, but no nothing nothing like what you get in parts of sub sub Saharan Africa, obviously. On the one hand, you're promoting that. On the other hand, you're saying, yeah, okay, we'll take... To be fair, it's a lot of money, right? I think so far they've taken $300 million from the British government. They've not had to do anything. Um, but basically, they're advertising to the world that we're a dump, we're a shithole. We're the worst possible place you could send people. And I don't think Rwanda is that, by the way. I think Rwanda's probably... I'm sure it has the potential to be a, a remarkable country. Um, amazing you know, natural assets, great climate, um, lots of solar potential. If you're thinking about becoming a more prosperous country in the 21st century it has a lot going for it. Uh, but you're, you're certainly not doing that by allowing the Tories to depict you as like the worst hellhole imaginable. Uh, the analog here is, of course, Nauru, which is used by the Aussies for um, their undocumented migrants. They send them to this you know, small island. I think there's another one as well. I think it's primarily Nauru, isn't it? You know, that, that's different. That's a, that's a micro state, fundamentally. Rwanda is a, is, a, is a country, it's not a large country, but it has a, a very densely populated uh, by African standards. It's a large-ish country. And this whole point about, well, what kind of country do you want to be in the 21st century? Broadly speaking, Africa is not developing as it, as it should be. You know, it's not falling into the slipstream that was created. It's not East Asia in the 70s, right? But there are some countries that are moving up the value chain and doing pretty well. In Kenya's one, you know, Nai Nairobi is becoming a, a major global hub partly because of its location near the Gulf, uh, young population, very well connected. But if you look at, for instance, the, the, major, the major cities um, on the face of the earth, I think even by 2050, all the world's largest cities will be in sub-Saharan Africa. By 2100, literally all of them, you know, Kinshasa, Dar es Salaam, Nairobi, Lagos, you know. So between uh, population growth and urbanization, Africa is going to see a hell of a lot of growth over the next 70, 80 years, economic growth. Will it be enough to, to, to meet the needs of people in, in sub-Saharan Africa? That's the, that's the $64 million question, particularly with climate change, particularly with not using fossil fuels. We don't know the answer to that. However, there are some countries who look like they could step up economically. And there are others which have the potential to be you know, economic global superstars like Nigeria, enormous country with incredible mineral assets. Uh, whether or not that happens, again, a, a question for another day. But what you're definitely not trying to do is advertise the whole world that we're a shithole and we're a dumping ground for, for people that the Brits don't want. Um, that is not what the Koreans and the Chinese um, and the Indonesians and various other countries in East Asia have been doing over the last 30, 40 years uh, as, a, as, a, as a developmental model. You know, megaphones the world. Yes, we're a dumping ground. Doesn't seem wise. And I think, fr frankly, K Kagame will probably, will probably pull out of it, I think. I think. I mean, they've got 300 million for nothing, but it seems to be more of a headache than it's worth at this point. Um, and I, you know, realistically, given the prospects of a Labour government, they wouldn't want to continue the deal. I mean, my God. Uh, there are very few examples of such toxic marketing you know, self-imposed toxic marketing strategies by a country. Uh, this is up there for sure. I'm not a contract lawyer, but I assume if you've just been handed 300 million pounds and you think the other side is going to withdraw from the contract, you wait for that to happen instead of saying, oh no, we're going to pull out of the contract and presumably therefore lose your rights to that 300 million pounds. If I was um, uh, mm -hmm. the, the president of Rwanda, I would be biding my time. Say, uh, you know, Labour are going to be in power soon. They'll pull out. Then we get to keep the money because that's how the contract works. I mean, as I say, I haven't read the contract, but that would seem, you know, from what I've read in the newspapers, it seems like they don't actually have an obligation to give that money back. I'd have thought if they pull out, they would do. So in a way, they're laughing. Um, but they, they probably don't want this to go on for much longer. So maybe if the Conservatives pull, you know, a rabbit out of the hat and dramatically um, win the next election, they might say, you know, we're not doing this for another five years.